joining us today and to inviting me to this wonderful forum. It appears that um, uh, the people that you've had here in the past have been um, uh, good company in, in my estimation from what I see. And uh, I'm so looking forward to having this discussion uh, post-election. Professor? Good to see so many friends and it's good to be back here at Niagara. And, uh, that video is outstanding, but two shots of David Orr. No shots of <laughs> Professor Green. We, need, we may need some editing. <laughs> I'll talk to my former student, Hilmi, about this. Then we go to yeah. I'm not wearing any more of my Turkish football scarves. Uh, well, uh, I'll start off real quickly giving you six basic points with two add-ons. Professors always have to have points or else you don't. By the way, I do teach at Roosevelt University in my spare time from the city club. So here we go. These are the basic sure. points. One, uh, if you compare 2008 to 2012, Barack Obama only lost two states that he carried in 08. That is uh, basically Indiana and North Carolina. Otherwise, the election was a carbon copy. So, other, so with all the hoopla, with all the money, with all of the up and back, with all of the talking heads, or if you watch election night, some of the screaming heads, the bottom line is only two states switched. Two, the election was never as close as these pundits, if I may use that word, uh, wanted to make it. Must keep in mind that American television, uh, American media, but especially the American television, the cable stations, are all very much in competition with each other. And I know this sounds awful, uh, especially coming from someone who does this for a living, talking in a class and lecturing, and sometimes you need the words to fill up the hour, they need words to fill up the, the, the news time. So it's a lot more interesting and exciting if it's a close race. Uh, from what I understand from uh, secret sources, of that they were never really in danger except after that first debate, which, you know, Barack Obama is very smart. Uh, he was, if you're a football fan, American football, he was playing a prevent defense. He just didn't want to make a mistake, just get it over with and move on. What he didn't realize is that Governor Romney, who was underrated as a campaigner, and certainly under, underrated by a lot of the Obama people for being a very bright man, really came to play. And I think if President Obama was taken back, then after that, the second and third debate, uh, they, it, they're not going to make that into a movie. So, uh, you know, <laughs> though it was li very much Lincoln-esque, a little known, and, uh, little noted, and not long remembered. <coughs> Number three, the demographics are totally changing American politics. Hot off the wire, because you know, okay. when you come to Niagara Foundation, yes. you can't have old news. Uh, it's very tough to win an election when approximately 25 to 27 percent of the people voting are overwhelmingly against you. Yeah. They start off with a base. Now obviously we all know about the African-American vote for President Obama, which by the way, to be blunt about it, wasn't all that much higher than it was for John Kerry, uh, or, or for that matter, for Al Gore. <laughs> but it's the Hispanic vote, the Latino vote, the fastest rising uh, uh, group in I'll get closer. The fastest rising group in um, American politics. What you have is that the uh, bottom line is is that they voted over 70 percent for Barack Obama, and were crucial in states such as Florida, Virginia, and the Mountain states, uh, New Mexico, Colorado, and there is no doubt in my mind that and, and Nevada. There's no doubt in my mind that Arizona is on the way to becoming a very con uh, competitive state largely on the basis of Latino voters. So, uh, that's point number uh, uh, three. And that is where you find this enormous percentage of Latino <laughs> voters going overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly for uh, uh, Obama. Also under demographics, like in 08, no doubt as much, the biggest demographic group by age, overwhelmingly, was 18 to 29 year olds. And if you look at politics, <clears throat> no disrespect to the two speakers, uh, 18 to 29 year olds are going to be around voting a lot longer than those over 65. Though some of us, you know, in getting closer, <laughs> we, we are going away for a long longer. time. But nevertheless, <laughs> when you're losing the youth vote, that's the, you know, 16, 20, 24, those elections. All right, number four. Uh, the, uh, what's going to happen afterwards? By the way, the, all the analysis of the election. You hear it all, it's fairly repetitive and kind of boring because it's, again, it's basically a, an ibit of 08. But what's really interesting to me is what's going to happen after the campaigning. 
As I once said in a lecture, governing is the interim period between campaigns. <laughs> You've got to do something. Remember, you campaign in adjectives and adverbs, you govern in nouns and verbs. You've got to do something. And so what you have then is this, they, you know, the fiscal cliff coming up, the polarization. The reality is, is that moderation, moderates, compromise, is a bad word in both parties. And it has been somewhat uh, minimized in the Democratic Party because of the overwhelming uh, <coughs> focus on Barack Obama and the people who basically are <laughs> a half a block from here uh, at the Prudential Building, led by Axelrod and Plouffe and Messina, I mean, these guys, in the old days, they'd be part of the Dillinger gang. I mean, these, this, this was not a bunch of friendly people serving tea. They were in it to win, and win at all costs. So what you have, in effect, is that it was somewhat diminished. Now, I've been on the record as saying that Barack Obama wasn't an African-American. He might have very well had a, a, a primary challenge from the left because of uh, policies that he allegedly did not pursue, et cetera, et cetera. But nevertheless... Once he is gone, and he is right now a lame duck, and one thing about a second-term president, you get lamer every day you're in office, that the reality is that the Democrat the left is going to be erupting. Uh, and you know that's going to happen if you start seeing Dennis Kucinich on television. <laughs> <laughs> that is the clear sign that things are about to get unraveled. And so the reality is that both Democrats and Republicans in these districts, their real fear isn't necessarily opposition, but fear of a primary challenge. He's not a true Republican. He's not a true Democrat. And so, so what you do, that, that you have challenges from with your own party, which really limits your ability to compromise. I mean, Senator Luger lost in the, and, and in the end in a primary to the fellow who redefined rape and, and, and women's sexuality, and in, the, and in Missouri, uh, the Aiken won a, 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 a three-candidate race when the, the woman who he beat barely would have overwhelmingly defeated McCaskill for re-election. Again, the fear of these individuals, be it Tea Party on the right, I don't know what we'll call the, uh, on the left, maybe the Latte Party, whatever. They are, they are going to make sure that you are not going to have compromise. Number five, uh, the Illinois uh, Republicans are basically in free fall. Uh, uh, I wrote this down, excuse me. Never, first time in history, the Illinois, state of Illinois, one party not only controls all three branches, uh, the, the two, uh, the governorship and both chambers, but in both chambers, the House and the Senate, the state Senate, they have veto proof majorities. Never happened before. Which means that perhaps the most interesting politics won't be between Democrats and Republicans, but will be between Democrats and Democrats. Uh -huh. Because when you have so much going on, remember, politics is about competition. And if the other side isn't putting up much of a fight, if they become conscientious objectors, uh, you're going to be fighting with your own. And that, I think, is a strong possibility. Last point, and I'll turn it over to Alderman Marino. Basic economic issues, jobs, and the deficit remain. The one thing that is different between now and with the advent of all this money in politics, these 30-second commercials, the... Uh, absolute uh, uh, elaborate uh, campaign uh, techniques, by the way, a billion dollars each guy spent, yes, and a lot more, is that you don't deal with the serious issues. There is a mismatch now between campaigning and policy. Uh, <coughs> not that we've ever really done that. I mean, the new movie coming out, Lincoln, 1860 election was about policy. Okay, we could go there. 1896, gold versus silver, policy. I mean, you've had elections like that, but in recent memory, uh, it is less and less about policy. So the deficits and the job crisis, the beat goes on. Last point, I have to change my lecture. Now, you know, some of us get a little older, don't like too much change, right? Uh, when, you, when, you, when you look at what happened on last Tuesday, uh, no president in modern time has ever been reelected with an unemployment rate mm. above 7.2. Now I have to change my lecture to 7.9. This election should have been a rout for the Republicans. Almost 8% of the American people that are counted are unemployed. 
This has never been close to this kind of number. And yet, President Obama and his team actually uh, won this election, and if you know our system in the Electoral College, it was a landslide. That's it. Excellent. The money situation in politics these days. Um, I was uh, fortunate to see uh, Senator Feingold this past weekend, and um, it Which is... Tommy is. Tommy is. <laughs> oh, he is the former um, senator from uh, Wisconsin, uh, who along with Senator McCain uh, wrote uh, the McCain-Feingold Act that tried to uh, very much put uh, the money situation uh, in, in order, they, they passed uh, some very, very significant legislation um, that said, indeed, if you do donate uh, these amounts of money to candidates or to parties, uh, we need to know where it comes from. I mean, that's, that's basically what it was about. It was about disclosure. We need to know where these dollars are coming from and uh, where, that, where they're going. Uh, the Supreme Court overturned a portion of this, and uh, once again, I think that this issue is going to be raised uh, because I suspect, and I don't have the Supreme Court down just yet, that our president is going to be able to appoint some new members of the Supreme Court. When I think about it, though, I think that mostly the elderly people on the Supreme Court <laughs> Are all the Democrats? Are they not? Could you, how's well, your memory on there's this? There's the uh, well. There's the the one and only Justice Scalia, another University of Chicago guy. Uh, but but yes. he's 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 young. He'll there never die. He'll never die. <laughs> okay, but, uh, right. Uh, no, but uh, Mrs. Ginsburg would be my. Okay, so uh, that's just a, okay. So that's a scenario where you're just going to uh, be replaced with a, another liberal on on, on the on the court. Um, so anyway, I'm just saying that, the, that one of the most important things in my mind about Barack Obama being reelected is uh, the possibility of the Supreme Court uh, changing some members, and that, that, that's always going to be certainly a concern for, for the Democratic Party. Um, but I also want to say, um, and, and like I said, I, I, I think that the issue of, of, of money needs to be one that continues to be uh, discussed because I, I think it's important. Um, I, I, sometimes I use this analogy. You know, if you're if you're going to the uh, if you're going to, to to the gas station and you know buying a gallon of gas, and 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 now the corporation of BP gets to turn around and and take those dollars and donate it. You really don't. You don't have anything to say about that. I, I want to know about these things. I want to know who, what corporations are indeed donating money to to what parties. Um, I also wanted to just comment a little bit on um, uh, what we've been talking about lately, which is the demise of the Republican Party because they're all white, older white men. I, you know what? I don't think the Republican Party is going away anytime soon. No, our older white men. <laughs> yeah, they're going to be around <laughs> until they're 100, okay. Uh, but uh, please chime in on this. Um, I, um, I, I see them um, having to uh, revamp uh, what, what they're, how, they're, how they go forward from this point on. And truthfully, from the, from the very election night they're looking at four years from now, uh, and who that next candidate is going to be. Is that going to be a Jeb Bush? Is that going to be a Paul Ryan? Uh, they need to start uh, revising um, how they get out their vote, who their, um, who, who their supporters are, and uh, think a little bit about, not think a little bit, think quite a bit about how they're going to revise this. And it's always difficult, I think, in, in both parties on, on how, do you, how do you deal with uh, the extreme portion of your party. Uh, the Tea Party seemed to me um, over these last few years to get a lot of attention um, from the more moderate members of the uh, Republican Party. But, you know, you can't go down that road if indeed you're going to be able to be elected. You might be able to be elected in your primary, but then when you come to a general election, there's no way that you can win. And the Democrats have had that same um, uh, issue in the past. Can you give me an example, Professor? What, what, George, uh, George McGovern. McGovern. Okay, George McGovern was one of those very, you know, when, when, you, when, you, 
when, when your party allows the extremes, usually in the Republican Party, okay, to the, to the right and the Democratic Party to the left, you know, you're not going to be able to win the general election. Um, so that's something I think that um, um, the Republicans, um, certainly I don't need to tell them this. I'm, I'm pretty sure that they've figured this out by now. Um, I think it was uh, the, the Fox News and Karl Rove that wouldn't let them uh, call the election uh, until, you know, rather, rather late. Um, so, you know, they're, 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 um, they, they certainly have some, some issues to deal with. Um, however, I have to say, once again, the Democrats haven't been, um, are, are not, uh, they, they, they clearly know that this is an issue during the 80s. Uh, you know, the, what did we call them, the, the uh, uh, Reagan Democrats? Reagan Democrats. Yeah, Reagan, I mean, that, that was something that we had to overcome uh, over, over a decade uh, to get back to, to our parties. Um, and another thing, I know that the professor talked a little bit about uh, the minorities and um, uh, the young vote, <laughs> but let me say, I think that the, the, the women's vote uh, across the board really... Uh, came through uh, even people that had generally been Republicans. I think those women may have crossed over uh, and voted for uh, Barack Obama. So um, I think that those are those are a couple of things. I know there were some some other I wanted to touch on. Oh, here was something that I thought was particularly interesting. Um, <coughs> We in politics, we, we spend a lot of time, you know, knowing who our supporters are that are going to, that we know are good voters and those people indeed are going to come out and vote for us. Now, the Obama campaign took this in an, a whole nother direction in my estimation, okay? You know who they identified? They identified people they thought that they were supporters, but they were unlikely to vote. And here I'm talking about um, immigrants, uh, newly, you know, uh, new citizens that are immigrants and, um, uh, and young people. These people are, yeah, they're great Barack Obama supporters, but you know what? They don't come out to the polls. Not this case, not this time around. I don't know quite how they did it, but they clearly brought those people out to vote. And I think that that's something that the um, Obama campaign really needs to pat themselves on the back because it's difficult, whether it be Democrats or Republicans, to engage young people in, in politics. It's something that we find uh, very, very much uh, to be a challenge. Um, and then lastly, let me just say that from, from this point forward, from the, the, <coughs> night, the very night that uh, uh, the returns were in, starts the next election, all right? Um, so I'll, I'll be curious to hear if you have some thoughts on who you might see there. I've noted a couple of uh, Republicans, and I suspect that Hillary Clinton clearly is um, uh, looking and considering the uh, uh, presidential race in four years. Um, but if anything, uh, it's, uh, it's an exciting business to be in. Thank you. Normally, just for the record, Political parties are not part of the American Constitution. There's nothing in the Constitution about political parties. There's nothing in the Constitution about <coughs> national conventions. There's nothing in the, the Constitution about how you run an election. Uh, each state runs their own election. Remember, we don't have, uh, we have the French Council General. We don't have the British Council General, do we? You can't see Robert. Good, and then we can make fun of him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> remember, uh, this country revolted against the United Kingdom. And we went out of our way to make sure that this process in this country, its politics are very decentralized. Like, we haven't elected a president yet. That's not going to come until December, next month, when the electors vote. And then it's not going to be known officially until the vice president in January opens up the envelopes. So we have a very, very unique system, partly brought out of the revolution. But the political process that creates the president is all up to the states. Illinois by itself has 110 election districts. Uh, David Orr, whose picture you saw several times <laughs> on the uh, Niagara uh, uh, thing, uh, he runs the Cook County election. But there's a Chicago election, and then there are 108 other election districts throughout Illinois. No one tells them how to do the ballot. No one tells them what kind of machinery they need. It's all up to them. And this is the same way over... I was just going to say, how about Florida? In, well, they, they're still coming. <laughs> and the they're hanging chads. Yes, we can. <laughs> Let's not bring that up again. That was 
That's two months of my life that will never come back. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to stress is that what the Republicans did in old, and, oh, it's not like Sarah Payne went in 012, what the Republicans did in 12 was to copy the Democrats of 08. That is having a long process of getting the nomination. In other words, the, the Republicans thought that the Obama-Clinton campaign of 08, when they went at each other, really, the best primary, no, the best nomination fight I, I've ever seen in, in all the years. But that was really two heavyweights slugging each other. And <coughs> some of you may have heard it, uh, using the Illinois rules, there's no Marcus of Queensbury. Low bl blows are, are, are allowed because you wear your trunks around your ankle. So going at each other. And the Republicans in 12 thought, boy, that was really good for the Democrats. Unfortunately for them in 12, they only had one legitimate candidate. That was Romney. And so by, elong by stretching out that process, Mr. Romney was forced to take positions he did not want to take to win the nomination. And he was running against people who probably, a couple of them, could very well end up in institutions. Because, <laughs> the, you know, if, if, if this is democracy, uh, maybe we need to revisit George III. So the, the reality was is that they put Romney in a terrible situation. I mean, again, his sanity had to be impacted debating. I, I have to agree because weren't there, uh, weren't there a whole series of candidates that continually, came, every time somebody dropped off, another one would pop up? I and, mean, and, and, and be number one. Yeah. And yeah. lead. Mm -hmm. Kane, uh, Gingrich, uh, Perry, Santorum. Santorum. Yeah. These are not candidates from Mount Rushmore. And so what and, you and by the time he got to the general, he was, oh, I thought he did a tremendous job just keeping his sanity with all this. I have, by the way, just for the record, I have dubbed the people who ran against Romney in the Republican nomination fight the seven dwarfs. So just so you know, um, I mean, it was, it, was, it was the worst group of candidates I have ever seen as a group. Now, you always have a bunch of loonies running. Remember, the Democrats in 08, when they had the big debate in, in, in 2007 at Soldier Field, I don't know if you were there, Ms. Alderman Marino. How many how many they candidates? were lined up across the stage. How many candidates did we have? There? Like nine, including Dennis Kucinich and uh, Joe mm -hmm. Biden, who mm -hmm. lost a lot of money in this campaign. Because some of you may not realize, uh, he had a big contract with Colgate. If he lost, he was going to do their <laughs> their teeth commercials. <laughs> uh, that's why he you, smiled buddy. so much in that debate because okay. he had a, he had a good going. But but once again, the Republican. I mean, this Mitt Romney really had to go through uh, hell. you know hell in order to get to where he was, and then it was just so downhill from there. I'm making a prediction, and I'll come back four years to say how right I was. I guarantee you, the political leaders of the Republican Party, and there may be new ones, Mr. Priebus from. Uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, didn't do very well. Uh, there may be a new Republican national chairman. They are going to shorten that nomination fight. Uh, it ended in June or late May. And one of the factors that's a serious one, I think in a retrospect, well, if there was any chance of, well, let me rephrase it positively, the Obama campaign blasted Romney in May, June, and July. And given the fact that he had spent so much money on the nomination, he did not have the money to fight back until after the, the, the convention. So he was a punching bag for them. And the, in politics, Alderman Lurino probably would agree with me, the best way, if she ever has an opponent, the best way, the best way to defeat an opponent is if you define him or her. And they define Mitt Romney as some, you know, whatever. You guys know as well as I do. So the bottom line is they're going to change their process of nomination in 2016 because they don't want to have one of these pop-up candidates. And remember, look at the media. Every time one of these yo-yos came up there, like Senator, like this guy Kane, 999, remember him? Uh, a pizza oh, man no, with, a, oh, who had, shall yeah. we say, very mm -hmm. European style about mm -hmm. him. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll stop right yeah. there. Uh -huh. I'll just stop right there. I mean, he was leading, he was leading the fight. And here's Romney, you know, who's a legitimate candidate, having to deal with these, and, and the endless, meaningless debates. I mean, so, it's going to change. Just so you know, if four years from now, and Margie's right, it's going to, it started already. It has. It but, absolutely has. But they're going to change their process, and they're going to try and go back to the old days, where by March you know who the candidate is, and you prevent these pop-ups. That's what I call them, pop-ups. They pop up and they pop down. By the way, you notice at that convention? Which convention? The Republican the convention. Republican? Did, did, did Gingrich speak? I don't know. No. Yeah. no. So no. none of them spoke. They, none of them spoke. Although he's a good author. 
He is a very he's good a author. He's a very good and writer. He's, and he's, I have and he's to say that about him. That's the reason mm -hmm. he has his wife standing mm -hmm. next to him at all times. Mm -hmm. She never moves her lips. <laughs>